So, Robert, in your experience, what is the, um, if you look at the UK's current amphibious all bat, for word of a better word, um, is, it, is it sufficient in your view at the moment? Well, it's sufficient to what we say we're going to, going to do in its current form. Um, but we've already knocked three holes in it. We know that ocean is going to go, and there is the possibility of, uh, of losing two LPDs. Now, if that was the case, it would be a completely incoherent capability for all of the reasons that, uh, that we've just said. I think um, the, uh, the shipping that was, um, that was still in play after the last defense review against the scale of force that we expected to have to put, a, put ashore was about in balance, but things have changed sufficiently then, since then to have knocked that balance out. Um, I'd also say, and it's, it's partly an answer to this question, but also partly an answer to the one that went before, what we're talking about here is amphibious operations at the very top end of warfare, and that's exactly what you should be testing us upon, because everything should be judged against that. There are, of course, a whole range of other operations that are taking place habitually um, around the world. In the last year or 18 months, there has been um, hurricane relief in the, in the West Indies. There have been um, operations in the Mediterranean trying to limit um, the, uh, the movement of, uh, of refugees um, uh, across the Mediterranean Sea, and there have been anti-piracy operations off the eastern coast of, of, of Africa. So I think that in order to understand fully the range of amphibiosity, mm. you need to have those things in mind just yeah. as much as you have in mind the very most testing operations. What would you say to a government that says to the military and the top-level budget holders, you've got a budget, right? It is increasing. If you can't manage it, I'm, I'm sorry about that but you have a budget, and if you decide to cut amphibious capability, that is for you. What, what should the government do in that instance? Um, I don't presume to give the government advice. Um, it seems to me that if that choice is taken, then it's ignoring both the evidence of history and also everything that we can see about the future. Now, Julian touched on, on um, amphibious operations. I mean, the entire Second World War was essentially about amphibious operations, about breaking back into uh, Europe, it was about getting into North Africa. The entire Pacific campaign was based upon an amphibious, a series of am amphibious operations. And there is an unbroken thread um, through everything we have done, virtually since the, um, the army under Wellington was inserted into the uh, peninsula um, during the Napoleonic Wars. This has been a constant theme. Everything that we look at in the future um, globalization increasingly means that the resources which actually service um, global economies are moved by sea. One of the things, and I, some of the figures here actually surprise me, um, I think over the last few years, for the first time in human history, more people live in cities than don't live in cities, and I think the number is about 52% at the present time. That number will, exist, uh, will increase to something like 75% by the middle part of this century. Overwhelmingly, those cities will be on the coast because that's where resources land. And so, particularly in the global south, we will have these huge conurbations. Take, for example, the, um, the contiguous area between Sao Paulo and, uh, and Rio de Janeiro. It's over 40 million people at the present time, let alone what's going to happen in the future. Think of Lagos, think of Karachi, think of Dakar, and think of the liabilities that we might have as a globally oriented nation. It seems to me that not only looking backwards, but also looking forwards, mm. the case to remain in the game yeah. at an effective level is overwhelming. And, and that, that is very clear. My, my question is, is if the, um, you know, the, the government understands that, right? The Prime Minister, the Chancellor, the Defence Secretary, they understand that. But we, we have a, a budget within which any organisation has to operate. And if that budget is handed over to the Royal Navy, so it's cut down into four, isn't it? Navy, Air Force, Joint Force, Army. Handed over to the Royal Navy. They cannot live within that budget. And they decide to remove the amphibious capability. What do you expect the government to do about it? Because with, with due respect, you know, your, your level of senior officer is there, or certainly was there at the time and is now replaced by your predecessors. What is going wrong that we cannot live within that budget? And we are now facing, you know, you, you cannot justify removing the amphibious uh, capability from this nation. I get that. Everybody gets that. But what else do we do? What are the mistakes and how do we get around it? Um, I think we exist between um, two poles of defence procurement. 
the American example and the French example. In America, you have a large number of um, very large, effective producers. That gives you the ability to drive down price and gives you the ability to lead in terms of research. The French have a system of dirigism, which you are aware, where the state is closely allied to the major defence producers. We lie somewhere in the middle. I think that historically our defence procurement has been poor and we don't always get value for money. And it seems to me perfectly legitimate that we try and do far better at that than we, we have uh, done in the past. So my first challenge would be to say, do better with the money that you already spend. <clears throat> and there would be comparative um, figures that would be able to compare us internationally. And I suspect we do very, very badly in that. Um, you are leading me in a direction where I could either be critical of the first sea lord of the day or critical of the, of the government of the day. I'm not going to do that at the present, uh, at the present time. I recognise that there are a series of uh, challenging questions here. It seems to me wrong to contemplate losing something which has been so significant in the past and seems to me to be so significant in the future. The only answer I can give to you directly is let's get better at doing the business of defence, the, the, uh, the pound, shillings and pence business of defence, and do that as well as we do the operational business of defence. Can you regenerate amphibious capability quite cheaply and quickly? No, of course you can't. First of all, you have to bring the ships into, into service. And in fact, I'd use the example of carrier air. How long is it going to be before the first of those um, aircraft carriers is available and it actually performs as a functioning operational platform, something like a decade? And exactly the same period of time would be true for amphibious platforms as well. Okay, and how, how um, have more recent reforms and restructures, so if you think about Commander 21 and things like that, um, how have they affected operational effectiveness and capacity? I think that they've made a significant difference at a tactical level. They haven't changed uh, the calculus at all at the operational or the strategic levels. And I think that that's an, at the strategic level, that's an enduring thing. I think recent reforms have made um, some significant differences in terms of the way in which we tactically deploy. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.